Hey Grace Church, my name is Josh. Welcome to the weekly for the week of March 5th. Today we are talking about the end of the world as we know it. So in Mark chapter 12, Jesus has been through what is called the controversy narrative, which means the religious leaders have come to him seeking to create controversial moments through these controversial topics. And then in Mark chapter 14 and 15, we enter what's called the passion narrative, which is the the end of the story where Jesus goes to the cross in our place, ultimately resurrects from the dead. And between Mark chapter 12 and Mark chapter 14 and 15, you have Mark chapter 13, And this is called the Olivet Discourse. And this is a conversation Jesus has with his disciples uh, where they talk about the end of the world. And it's on the Mount of Olives. So that's why it's called the Olivet Discourse. So let's take a look at this uh, from Mark chapter 13. And and before we do, I, I want to remind us that I know we come in with a lot of preconceived notions about the end of the world from books uh, that we've read or movies that we've seen like Armageddon or Book of Eli or I Am Legend or Quiet Place or Independence Day. I I get it. We all have these notions, but let's look at this together and see what Jesus had in his mind when he saw the end of the world. Uh, Mark 13, the literary genre is called apocalyptic eschatology, which means the final events of world history and the ultimate destiny of humanity. And so the the chapter starts by the disciples leaving the temple with Jesus. And they look at the temple and they say, wow, look at this magnificent building. And Jesus responds, do you see all these great buildings? Not one stone will be left on another. Every one of them will be thrown down. And so this is Jesus prophesying uh, the ultimate destruction of the temple that most scholars believed happened in A.D. 70 under the future emperor Titus, who comes with the Roman army and they ultimately overtake the temple. But the temple was this massive, beautiful building. It took 80 years to construct, 80,000 workers to construct, 36 acres, which is like 350 basketball courts were in the temple. And the people believed that the temple's existence gave them favor with God. And so Jesus comes and he says, you've been trusting in the rituals of the temple instead of a relationship with God. And there is coming a day when this whole thing is going to fall But what will never fall is the relationship that you have with God through me. And and so even the temple itself had become an idol for the people, which is pretty crazy to think that this beautiful, massive building was only finished for four years before it's ultimately overthrown. It started construction in 20 BC. It finished construction in 64 AD. And in 70 AD, it's torn down. And Jesus is so matter of fact about it. He's like, it's going to fall. This whole temple is going to fall. Uh, but ultimately, I am the greater temple. So the disciples, they hear this, and they have questions. And so they go to the Mount of Olives, and they ask him. They say, tell us when this is going to happen, and when will this be fulfilled? In verse 3 and 4, what are the signs of the times? What are the signs of your coming? And in verse 5, Jesus responds, watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name, claiming I am he, and they will deceive many. So right out of the gate, Jesus says, as we start talking about the end of the world, Watch out that you're not deceived. There will be false teachers. There will be people that claim to be the Messiah. Don't be taken off guard in this. The, the enemy is going to be active in this season. Spiritual warfare is going to be happening. Lots of lies will be around. Every generation will have false Christs. Every generation will have false teachers teaching about false Christ. Right now, if you go on Wikipedia, there are eight people alive right now claiming to be Jesus Christ right now on Wikipedia. So Jesus warns us of this. And he says, there will be lots of false truths in the future. So be sure you know the real truth. You know the word of God. Then verse 7, it says, when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, don't be alarmed. Such things have to happen. Uh, these are, there's going to be earthquakes and kingdom against kingdom, famines in various places. These are the beginnings of birth pains. So Jesus is saying, don't panic. Every time you hear of rumors of war, don't panic. Um, again, according to our friend Wikipedia, in the past 3,400 years of human history, there, we've only been at peace for 268 years. So 8% of recorded history have we been at peace. And so Jesus is like, don't panic. Uh, these are not the end, but these are signs of the end. These are signs of the last days, though they are not the last days. And this kind of gives us this tension here that Jesus is teaching, not yet, but be ready. Not yet, but be ready. When you see these things coming, they are birth pains. Uh, when my wife had a baby, 
uh, Harper, there was, she had birth pains, but, but when the frequency and the intensity of the pain picked up, that's when we called the doctor, that's when we went to the hospital. So Jesus is saying the birth pains exist, but there's going to be a time when the frequency and the consistency increase, and that's when you need to be ready. And, and again, this, this picture is uh, birth pains, is this idea of God's judgment coming to the world, and so that is on the way. Uh, then in verse 9 through 13, Jesus goes on to talk about persecution that's going to increase in the last days, but the gospel must be preached. He, he says that there's going to be uh, times where you'll be brought before governors and councils and places where they're going to put you on trial for following Jesus. And he's, he's encouraging persecuted believers to, to realize that the Holy Spirit's going to give them the words to say. The Holy Spirit's going to meet them in that moment and supernaturally empower their words. And so there's, there's this time period of persecution coming. And, and this is where the church starts to uh, look at end times charts and end times eschatology thoughts. And, and they have different categories for that. And I, I don't want to walk through every single one of what is premillennial, what is postmillennial, what is all millennial. Uh, those are important topics. And I think they're worthy of lots of dialogue. But in this particular passage, that, that's not so much what Jesus is saying. In, in the, the specificity instance, he's rather giving an overview saying, there is a time coming. Um, here's how my Bible teacher said it, that, that on the wall of heaven, there is a calendar. And on that calendar, there is a date circled. And that date says, send my son back to collect the family. Now, how that's going to happen, whether it's before the persecution, during the persecution, after the persecution, there's, there's, there's debate. But the clarity is, Christ will return again. He will come again in power, and there will be persecution as, as He enters into the world. But we must endure because the gospel has to go to the ends of the earth. And so that, that should give us great hope. And our hope as Christians should not come from the idea of being raptured out of this big bad world. Our hope as Christians should come in the fact that Jesus is going to come for us, and He is going to create new creation. That we will see a resurrected world. We will see resurrected bodies. We will see resurrected everything because He has promised that to us. So yes, He will come for us. And the implications, I think, are profound. The implications are, uh, we, we should realize our life is precious. Our lives are on a clock. This world is on a clock. And we should be struck by the story that, that we are hopeless without Christ coming to rescue us. And the good news is He is going to rescue us. And we should put our hope not in the temple. We should put our hope not in our good works, but we should put our hope in Christ. And the truth is that, that in our brokenness, He won't leave us. He will come for us. He will not forsake us, but, but He's going to pursue us even to the point of going to the cross in our place, resurrecting from the dead, ascending to the Father, and then returning again in glory to draw the family to Himself. That should overwhelm us and, and move us. Uh, verse 13 of Mark 13 says, Everyone will hate you because of me, but the one who stand firm to the end will be saved. That's the key verse for us this week. Everyone will hate you because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. I know it's not a pleasant thought for us to think about death. Uh, it's not a peaceful thought often to think about death. Uh, because dying means that you could be in this place of all these unanswered questions. And, and the lack of peace comes from this thought that I don't have an advocate before God. And Christ comes to us and says, I, I am your advocate now. Let me die in your place. Let me pay the penalty of sin. Let me overcome the power of sin. So, so the good news about salvation is that Jesus doesn't just pay the penalty for our sin. He overcomes the power of sin for us. He overcomes the power of death for us. And so for us as a church, the response is fairly simple. Um, do you have the hope of knowing that your sin is paid for? Do you have the assurance of knowing that Jesus will return and, and gather you to himself? Do you have the comfort of knowing Jesus in a world that's filled with discomfort and unrest? Have you personally made that decision to follow Jesus? Because this, this passage is clear. Jesus has called people to follow Him out of this world. And He has paid the penalty of sin for us. And He will return again for us. And so are you standing firm in that truth? So as you move into a time of discussion, I realize we're all over the place in this topic. But my hope is that we would see the second coming of Christ and we would be comforted by it. We would be moved by it. Yes, we can talk about the details and the timeline. All of that is fascinating and interesting and beautiful. 
Uh, but as a church, when we look at the second coming of Christ, I pray we would be comforted, we would long for that day, and that ultimately our comfort wouldn't just be that we were ripped out of here in the rapture, but rather that Christ is going to bring about new creation, and that new creation starts in our heart, starts in our chest, and from there ultimately becomes the new creation of all things, because that's the power of Christ in the world.